Hello everyone and welcome to Metamorphic Rocks. I'm the last of our lectures in our first unit and my throat is already feeling funny. Here we go, that's better. The last of our units and the last of our lectures in our first unit. <clears throat> And so let's get on with it. So what is what are metamorphic rocks and what is metamorphism? Well, metamorphic rocks is the third sort of category, if you will, of rock. Um, you know, people I know who, oh, I took a geology class. Let me see if I can remember. There's igneous rocks and sedimentary rocks, and they can never remember the third metamorphic rocks. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> metamorphic rocks are rocks that have changed um, through the application of mostly heat and pressure. Um I liken the, pro the, uh, the process of metamorphism to cooking, right? You take something like, let's say, bread dough um, that is not really edible, uh, and you stick it in the oven at, I don't know what, 250 degrees for however long, um, and you bring it out, and it has transformed. Um, it has transformed into something else. In this case, bread, all right? You can cook with pressure. My mom has a pressure cooker. You put a roast in there and you let that thing go and you'll have cooking done in much shorter time because you're doing it under pressure. And so you can cook with heat and pressure. And indeed, a lot of times when we look at metamorphic rocks, we kind of colloquially refer to them as having been cooked. And so um, in the real world, though, this is a very complicated process. Uh, we're talking about high pressure, high temperature, mostly solid state chemistry, right? Not, not you know, the kind of chemistry you do in, in most normal chemistry classes where you mix, you know, aqueous solutions, i.e. solutions in water and see what happens. There's not, there's some water, we'll, we'll see that, but there's not a lot. We're not talking about aqueous solutions here. We're, we're mostly really talking about um, pretty solid state chemistry. And then it's happening over literally millions of years uh, and so as I said in the real world this is terribly complicated uh, in our little bubble it's not going to be that complicated if you go on and metamorphic rocks you're going to need a couple classes in physical chemistry and some other things and stuff like that and so hold on I need to sneeze I'm going to pause this for a second that is the cool thing about recording lectures is I can pause it <laughs> anyway okay so so uh so what are the agents of metamorphism what 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 happens uh, to these rocks how do we get them to change well we already talked about one uh and that is um you know the application of heat right and so we need to heat the rock. There's a couple ways to do this. Uh, one is to uh, is to uh, bury the rock, right? Uh, you, you bury the rock, and that 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 will definitely heat it up. We already learned about the the um, the geothermal gradient when we talked about igneous rocks, uh, and so yeah, burying rock deep enough will will heat it enough to metamorphose it. Um, it um, there was something else I wanted to say about that. Forget what it was. We'll come back to it. Uh, the other source is uh, is magma, right? And you can see here at this, you know, at this um, convergent plate boundary, uh, you know, yeah, the the burial of this lithosphere or crust will uh, will heat the rock. But also, you know, once after it melts, now it's no longer metamorphosing. Now it's magma. Now we're back to igneous rocks, um, and you know that that rising magma uh, will heat the rock in direct contact with it especially up in here and will do something called contact metamorphism where you know right there for just a couple feet literally around that magma chamber uh, that rock is um, is metamorphosed due to the introduction of heat you know the other kind of source of heat is pressure right the pressure of continental collision or something like that that's kind of like burial uh, a little bit different though and so you know uh heat pressure um uh, kind of go together and so you apply that pressure by bearing it or you apply that pressure through continental collision uh, and you can do it that way or you can just heat the rock uh, with magma and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now the interesting thing if you remember about that geothermal gradient is that under normal circumstances if you just bury rock you don't heat it enough to melt it, right? And that was a whole thing we did with magma generation. Uh, and this is an interesting point to bring up again now is that you cannot heat the rock so much that you melt it 
right? If we're going to apply pressure uh, and heat to a, to a um, to a rock in order to metamorphose it, if you melt the rock, you're done metamorphosing, and now you got magma, and now you're back to igneous rocks in texture and composition, right? So so metamorphism has to happen, you know, in this zone, if you will right in here between 200 and about what 700 or so degrees celsius um where where rock is still solid right because you know down in here there's not enough heat to metamorphose anything now you're just down here you know dealing with sedimentary conditions up in here you're dealing with magma and igneous conditions and so you know in between those two is where you uh, is where you metamorphose rock if you if you heat it too much you melt it and now we're back to igneous. And so, so like I said, this meta, these metamorphic processes are complicated in the real world because they happen in a solid state. So, so, so heat's a thing, but what else? Well, you need some confining pressure. Um, generally, you, it, uh, it results from burial. You don't, you do not, um, you don't metamorphose rock at the surface uh it's not buried enough to heat it uh if you apply pressure to it it just kind of deforms and it doesn't metamorphose right and so so confining pressure is important right once that rock is buried you know yes you have heat from burial you have pressure from burial in all directions this is called isostatic pressure um water pressure is also isostatic pressure right um if you uh if you take a uh, an inflated balloon down to the bottom of a pool the balloon doesn't flatten it just gets smaller okay because that water pressure is coming from all directions so so it doesn't deform the rock it might change the volume of the rock uh it'll it'll compress it on all sides and make it quote unquote smaller okay but you need that confining pressure for metamorphism uh you just you you really just do otherwise otherwise it doesn't metamorphose it'll just deform so the other thing you need though is uh you need differential stress you need pressure from one in one direction so where where you know over here in this mountain range that rock there is just buried and is undeformed over here in the middle of the mountain range we've had you know pressure coming let's say let's say east west although we don't have a direction on here okay let's say right left okay coming from the right and the left and that is deforming the rock and causing metamorphism to happen okay there is just flat burial metamorphism that can't happen over here it's a little rare uh you have to bury rock pretty dang deeply to get that to happen uh what's way more common is this kind of uh metamorphism due to differential stress here that happens in this mountain range for example um the appalachian mountains right you go to the appalachians and all you see is metamorphic rock and we'll talk about why that is uh, a little bit a little bit later um so so yeah so heat pressure differential stress and then what else well the thing that people always forget about is water um now now uh not not a little not a lot of water <laughs> okay uh because one for one thing if you have too much water you're not going to metamorphose a rock you're going to melt it um but but you do need some water uh you need some water because we're going to need to move ions around the crystal matrix to recrystallize things and to, to get things more in equilibrium with the changed temperature and pressure conditions you're going to need to move ions new ions into the rock you're going to need to move ions out of the rock you're going to need to move stuff around and you can't do that in the absolutely dry solid state not easily um so you're going to need some fluids in there the fluid is usually water although other fluids will work uh not as well as water though but they, they will work so so you need to have heat pressure chemically reactive fluids and then the other thing that you need is time lots and lots of time uh metamorphism takes uh, takes it takes millions of years uh, you, you, you this isn't something that's going to happen overnight or anything like that it's going to take a very 
very long time and so you need to have that time uh you know and and when we talk about geologic time we'll we'll see how this this realization uh that we need a lot of time to get stuff done was actually quite revolutionary um in the field of geology and quickly set geology apart um from a lot of other sciences uh and and you know we started having to push back against a lot of things all at once because of our recognition that you know uh that time is is something that we're going to need a lot of uh to get geological processes done and metamorphism is uh is no exception to that so one of the big things that you see um in igneous rocks is foliation uh foliation and i don't have a definition on here and i probably should but foliation is this alignment of mineral grains uh, in the metamorphic rock and that alignment happens perpendicular to the pressure so if the pressure is running east west our foliation is going to run north south okay and it is just once again it is an alignment of these mineral grains okay and you see it a lot in metamorphic rock there's two basic varieties of metamorphic rock foliated and unfoliated or non-foliated and so we're talking now we'll, we'll begin with with foliated metamorphic rocks and so so um so how how does this happen well a few ways so so if we look here at a rock and let's say it's a granite or something like that right and so you know, you've got confining pressure so you got that that confining pressure that we need but then if we apply pre you know differential uh pressure from either from you know either side that causes these uh these platy minerals like mica or you know any kind of a flat mineral will reorient itself perpendicular to that pressure right and so and so you go from something like this granite here, where the mineral grains are aligned, however, just they just they're not aligned at all, to this nice over here where that differential stress has it's done a lot of things, but it's rotated those those um those platy minerals perpendicular to the direction of pressure and so you get this these this linear feature through the rock which is that foliation that that alignment of mineral grains perpendicular to the direction of pressure and this is very useful out in the field um or something yeah very useful out in the field because if you measure the direction that that foliation is running you know that the tectonic pressure that made that metamorphic rock was at right angles so you know that that you you know the direction that the tectonic pressure was coming from uh which can be really handy when you're when you're trying to sort out the tectonics of an area uh there's another thing called uh recrystallization or neocrystallization those are two different things um uh, recrystallization is taking existing chemicals and turning them into uh a different mineral right for example um I could go from graphite to diamond, right? Uh, which, you know, they're, they both have the same chemical formula. Uh, in this case, it's an easy one, C, uh, which is pure carbon. Um, but if I apply pressure to that graphite, um, it'll turn into a different, uh, different mineral. In this case, diamond. Okay, uh, you you generally don't not generally you don't make diamond from coal. By the way, uh, a friend of mine who studies tectonics and things, and I just had a very fascinating conversation about this on Facebook. And uh, the conclusion that we kind of came to was, yes, it is in theory possible to make. Um, uh, diamonds from coal but those conditions don't really exist in any reasonable way on the earth <laughs> so uh, uh he can you know, he says i could do it in a lab but you're not going to do it and yeah you're not going to do it anywhere else <laughs> so uh, so anyway um but uh so yeah but but there there are a number of minerals that are like this uh if you're in a lab you know about kyanite sylvanite and andalusite um uh, which are three minerals, three aluminosilicates that have the same chemical formula but form under different temperature and pressure conditions, which makes it really handy because you can, you, if you have that mineral, you know what temperature and pressure conditions there were. And that's an example of you know, recrystallization where one will turn into another as um, 
as the temperature and pressure conditions change. Neocrystallization is making a whole new um, mineral with elements that are being brought in. Uh, not just rearranging elements that you have, but 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 you know, um, bringing in new elements and things like that will will uh, cause neocrystallization, which is the formation of brand new minerals. And so yeah, so this these these new minerals though, whether they're recrystallized or neocrystallized, will um, will still align themselves perpendicular to the pressure. <laughs> and so once again foliation right once again foliation the other thing is if you have um if you have you know spherical mineral or even rock grains uh you're going to just simply physically flatten them right it's it's it, 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 it's really that simple right if i've got if i've got a kind of rounded mineral grain here maybe with some matrix in here around it or whatever and i apply pressure to it it's going to flatten right we also literally see this in conglomerates right if i have a the sedimentary rock conglomerate and i apply pressure to it i'll make a rock called a meta conglomerate uh which is a you know a conglomerate with flattened pebbles right and um and it, they're really handy because the direction of the pressure is really, really obvious, right? It's it's in you know if if the if the if the pebble is flattened this way, the pressure was running this way, right? If it was flattened back and forth, the pressure is up and down. It's really that simple. So that combination of things uh, makes what we call foliation. Okay, now uh, that foliation produces. Uh, some metamorphic textures um, in the rock. Uh, and so the lowest grade of, uh, of foliation is called slaty cleavage. And so th this gets a little tricky here because, excuse me, it's a rock, not a mineral. So it doesn't have cleavage per se uh you know it doesn't have you know a weak direction in the crystal matrix for the mineral slash rock to break along it's a rock it doesn't have a crystal matrix okay but here's the thing one of the first minerals to grow in, in a metamorphic environment is the mineral mica which you might remember from the minerals lecture has really good cleavage and so the grains of mica along that rock uh in that rock rather will bestow upon that rock if you will this tendency for the rock to break very flat um, it's not a molecular flat like it is in mica but it's pretty dang flat um and the you know and so and so while it's not technically cleavage we call it slaty cleavage Okay, and then uh, the, the metamorphic rock slate and the metamorphic rock shale are frequently not only confused with each other, but a lot of people don't even think they're the different thing, right? A lot of people will say slate when they mean shale or shale when they mean slate, or they don't even think there's a difference. There is. Uh, the, the sedimentary rock shale is made from clay particles. It tends to break flat because clay particles are flat. Um the uh, the metamorphic rock slate is frequently made from shale um it though is breaking flat because of the growth of those mica minerals those uh, we could call them micaceous um, minerals if we really wanted to get fancy and so the interesting thing about this though is that a lot of times uh let me go on and show you that that picture here um a lot of times that the the cleavage plane is perpendicular to the what used to be the bedding plane and so in some really really low grade slates a lot of times like i said the plane where that rock wants to break and the plane where that rock was originally deposited are different and so it'll actually break across uh what used to be the bedding planes right you know in the field it kind of looks like that right you know you get these very very flat surfaces um almost molecularly flat surface in a really well developed slate um this makes slate very useful uh for a number of reasons right first of all if, if you go to the right place um 
you can see slate roofs uh they'll build uh they'll make roofing tiles um out of slate uh this is particularly more common uh you know in in areas where there is slate right it's it's you don't you don't see this very much in florida because it's heavy who wants to ship that from you know wherever to florida uh just so someone can have a slate roof that would be very very expensive um slates also frequently used as an ornamental tile um, I would not put slate tile in your bathroom. That mica on the surface would make it very, very slippery. But as an ornamental tile on the wall or on a floor that's going to stay mostly dry, uh, it, it's a very attractive tile. Um, it's also, um, in the old days, not so much anymore, but in the old days, um, slate was what the, what the chalkboard was made of. Uh, this expanse of dark colored flat rock that people would write on with another rock chalk <laughs> and so you know uh it, you know uh for the longest time people were you know writing on one rock with another rock um in classrooms and whatnot uh if you have a very old billiard table it may weigh a ton uh almost literally um because the surface uh is slate uh that felt is covering slate uh which provided a very very flat surface for those billiard balls to roll around on also uh old optical benches in some physics Labs are made of slate. Uh, for a long time, if you needed a very, very flat, very, very solid surface, um, slate was what you went with. The right slate would break very flat um, along that, along that quote unquote cleavage plane and that could be useful for a number of things. Uh, if we apply more heat and pressure to that rock, those mineral grains, those, those mica grains get larger. And they, they become visible and they start to wrinkle uh, and we enter this area of kind of intermediate um, metamorphic rocks um, and they start to develop uh, a texture called schistosity uh, which is I know a weird word but these and this involves larger mica grains um, and and a more wrinkled uh, uh, foliation. You're not going to be able to use a, a mica schist for a pool table or a chalkboard or something like that. The mica grains are way too big, uh, and it's nowhere near flat, right? So this is kind of what you get with intermediate to high-grade metamorphism. The nice thing about these textures is the development of this foliation goes in lockstep with the amount of heat and pressure applied. Uh, more foliation or better foliation equals more heat and pressure. And so without knowing too much, you can pick up a rock and tell what um what uh how much heat and pressure have been going on. Like I said, remember, the point of rocks is not oh look a schist, right? Or oh look a granite or oh look a sandstone, right? The point of rocks is, you know, what can they tell us, right? And so you pick up a schist, if it's in C2, if you know that, you know, where you are is where it came from, you can say some things uh, about the uh, the metamorphic environment in that in that area. And so, yeah, so schist is kind of intermediate to high-grade metamorphism. Then with the high-grade metamorphism, uh, we get into um, what's called Nisic banding, uh, which is uh, this alternating dark and light banding that runs across the rock, right? And so you can see here that we've got a parent rock uh, with, you know, mineral grains going in every which direction, uh, like a granite. Imagine, I should put a little picture of a granite here, but like a granite, you've all seen enough granite now. Imagine a granite, okay? Um, I apply heat and pressure, and not only do the mineral grains align perpendicular to that heat and pressure, they also uh, separate themselves into alternating dark and light and dark and light and dark and light bands. And so what you get in, you know, very high-grade metamorphic uh, rocks is you get nisic texture or also nisic banding right where you get these alternating dark and light layers running through the rock uh, this is very very high grade metamorphism uh, and uh, you know once again though if the if the if the um 
if the foliation is running this way, the pressure is running this way. Uh, not that that's a whole lot of use there because that rock is loose and floating around, not what we would call in situ. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, we can just say, okay, yeah, that, that pressure was running perpendicular to the foliation. So, so there are some very common foliated metamorphic rocks. Let's take a look at them. We've already kind of alluded to some of them. We got one kind of new one, though. So first is a slate. Right, very low grade metamorphism, frequently confused with shale. Um, there's a few tricky ways to tell them apart. Uh, slate doesn't have any fossils in it, not usually. Uh, and and once again, this this layering that you see here is foliation, not bedding. All right, if that was a shale, that layering would be bedding, but it's a slate, it's foliation. The bedding could be running, I don't even, I can't see the bedding in this one. The bedding could be running, you know, any way, any direction. So, so yeah, now, a rock that we haven't really talked about yet, one step up from a slate, a little bit more heat and pressure makes a rock called a Delight. Now, now, once again, though, remember that you know this is kind of a this is all of this is a continuum, right? You know, yes, more heat and pressure, you know, makes different rocks, but but it's not like well, here endeth the slate and here beginneth the fillite, right? Those two things are going to gradually that slate is gradually going to turn into that fillite, and so there's going to be a lot of kind of intermediate stages there and so you know you might find a rock and you might want to call it a slaty phyllite or a phyllitic slate or something you know something in between right you know get creative with your rock naming here but but phyllites can look a lot like slate but you just you just look at them and there's this little shine on the surface uh those mica grains are big enough now that they're actually a little bit shiny uh and if you put it under your hand lens which you always have your hand lens with you in the field you, you can just see some little bit of mica uh, there's just, just a little bit more obvious mica, a little more mica. Now, if the mica gets really big, we go from a phyllite to a schist. And once again, you could talk about a schist toast phyllite or a phyllitic schist. You know, once again, it's all a continuum. But with a schist, now the mica grains are big. Uh, you can peel them with your finger now. You can see them. They're wrinkled. Um, more heat and pressure. More heat and pressure, right? And then... Um, we have the a rock named after that Nisic banding, uh, which is a uh, a um, well a nice right, and so uh, you know especially though let me let me also just go back here especially with schists there's lots of different kinds of schists uh, you could have a mica schist you could have um, graphite schist uh you can have garnet schist with garnet sticking out of them i got one of those at home somewhere uh you know you can you know because of those accessory minerals you can have all diff different kinds of schist phyllites are i'm oh, sorry other way phyllites are usually just phyllites slates are usually just slates uh but but you but schist a lot of times we add you know the name of the the most common accessory mineral that we see in them uh to kind of different differentiate them a little bit and then nices are honestly usually just nices uh very very high grade you heat that rock much more and it's going to melt and now you're back to uh now you're back to a um uh, a metamorphic environment now you're talking about you know cooling magmas and heat and pressure and things like that right and so i can show you i can show them to you all kind of at once shale is not a a metamorphic rock okay but you make slate from shale a lot um and so and so they put that on this diagram so you, you let's say you begin with a shale uh and then you apply heat and pressure to it you make a slate once again the layering in here is bedding the layering in here is foliation those are two different things right a geologist arrives in the field and starts looking at layering in rock the first question we ask ourselves is is that bedding or is that foliation because it matters it matters a lot right in one case you're in a sedimentary environment in another case you're in a metamorphic environment and you do not want to get that wrong uh, people will laugh at you if you get that wrong. Um, so anyway, so apply some more heat and pressure. Those mica grains that are invisible here but causing that flat breaking will get bigger. 
become visible, in which case that's a fill light. That's an awfully schisty fill light, but that's okay. Um, and then mica grains get really big, peelable, visible with the naked eye fingernails. That's a schist, even more heat and pressure, and you get you get a raw you get a nice. Okay, in all cases, the pressure is perpendicular to the foliation, and the better the foliation, the more distinctive the foliation, the higher the pressure. Okay, around here, you know, I'm, and, and this is, this is, um, I don't know if I've said this to you guys or not, but I'll say it now. Um, when you go into the Appalachian Mountains, the mountains up and down the east coast of the United States, you are looking at the ground down nubs of a formerly much taller mountain range. And the way we know that is when we look at the rocks that are now exposed on the surface, they're very high-grade metamorphic rocks. Uh, there's a lot of schists, there's a lot of gneisses, um, and things like that. Those are the rocks that normally form deep, deep in the roots of mountains. And that tells us that there used to be a lot more mountain up there, but it is worn down to the roots, uh, to the high-grade metamorphic rocks that are normally in the roots of mountains. Look, if you go somewhere like the Himalayas, if you're, you know, you're looking at sedimentary rock on the top of those mountains still. I mean that 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 mountain range is so young, uh, you know the, the the veneer of sedimentary rock on top of them has still not eroded away, and so um, but you come to our Appalachian Mountains and you're looking at the roots of those mountains. Uh, they are, uh, for me, they're beautiful. I love being up in them, but the geology for me is boring because it's all high grade metamorphic. All of it is high-grade metamorphic. You drive along the um, the Blue Ridge Parkway, you hike the Appalachian Trail, you're on the same kind of rock, pretty much, some exceptions, all the time. High-grade metamorphic rock, which, if you're into high-grade metamorphic rock, you're at Disneyland for geologists. If you're like me, and you look for fossils, meh, keep walking. You know, no one, no one hikes the Appalachian Trail looking for fossils, okay? Don't be that person. Don't do that. Okay. Um, now, not all metamorphic rocks are foliated, though. Um, we do have a, a whole host of non-foliated metamorphic rocks. Uh, and these are usually chemically pretty simple. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, you, you begin with something that doesn't have a whole lot of chemicals in it. There's not a whole lot you can do when you heat that thing. Right. Look, if, I, if I'm looking here, if I'm looking at like, you know, the, the, the origin of a lot of gneisses are granites. In a lot of cases, what we call the parent rock, the rock you begin with for a gneiss is a granite. Well, imagine all those minerals in a granite. Now imagine all those chemicals. Right. It's chemically very complicated. So when I apply heat and pressure to it, those chemicals can do all kinds of freaky things. Same thing really with a shale, the sedimentary rock. It's still got a lot of, you know, it's got a lot of clay minerals, which can be chemically very complicated. And so, you know. When you start applying that pressure and heat to it, it turns into a slate. You start growing mica grains, right? You start using those chemicals in different ways. Then, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and, and so you, 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 you have a lot more potential to make minerals that will respond to foliation. No, sorry, respond to heat and pressure with foliation. Uh, Non-foliated? Bang, you're usually starting with something pretty dang simple, really. Um, uh, for example, marble. Uh, like the marble that you find in a bathroom, okay? Marble is a non-foliated metamorphic rock. You begin with limestone. Um, now, limestone is rock, but it is a little bit unusual because it is one of those chemical sedimentary rocks, right, that has a pretty simple, simple chemical formula, CaCO3, right? Calcium, carbon, and oxygen. So, when I apply heat and pressure to it, it can't do much. It's got three chemicals, right? You're not going to make mica out of calcium, carbon, and oxygen. You're just not. Um, what you basically do is you recrystallize um, that calcium, carbon, and oxygen into bigger, honkier, chunkier crystals that you find in marble. Now, this particular marble has these dark layers going through it. That's called a stylite. That's a different thing that is not foliation. Hold on one second. I'm going to come back with a better picture of a marble. Give me one second, guys. 
Okay, let me show you a little bit more typical marble for what we're doing. Uh, frequently, you will see these layers in marble. Those are called stylites. They're, they're the result of organic accumulations in your limestone and things like that. Uh, if you're someone like Michelangelo, though, and you want to carve a pretty statue or something, you want a marble that looks like that. Right. Uh, and, it, and it is most frequently like that. It's, it's white. Uh, and what it is, is it's recrystallized calcium, carbon, and oxygen. Um, Low-grade marbles frequently still have fossils in them. Uh, and in fact, look carefully um, at marble tiles, and a lot of times you will still see fossils in them. They're deformed, but you can most definitely make them out. Uh, I forget the name of that mall, but that mall over in Tampa by the airport, the big fancy one, has this uh, marble tile on the floor that is full of fossils i think is it the west chase or something like that like i said over there by the airport uh it's it's full of fossils just full of them um and so um you know look for it it's really it's really quite cool it's a non-foliated metamorphic rock right there, there's there's no layered texture um in that in that marble um if i take a quartz sandstone and I metamorphose it, it makes a rock called quartzite. Um, and once again, this is a continuum, right? There is no point where we say, okay, here endeth the quartz sandstone and here beginneth the quartzite. Um, you know, you could have, you could have a really low grade quartzite or you could have a really high grade quartzite. This particular one is a very high grade one. And um, the key thing here is to look, telling these two apart, <coughs> can be tricky uh here's what you want to do you're a geologist in the field you always have a 10 powered hand lens around your neck you just do um it's just it's mandatory required equipment so look at the look at the rock with your hand lens if you see individual rounded kind of mineral grains in this case they're all going to be quartz okay uh, these sand grains um it's a quartzite or rather, I'm sorry, I got that wrong, didn't I? It's a quartz sandstone. Okay, now, when you apply uh, pressure and heat to this, you get something called, um, uh, sorry, pressure solution, right? And so, you know, like right there where those two are touching, they will melt right there where they're touching, just a wee bit right there where they're touching. And so what you will end up with with enough of that is what you see over here, which is a bunch of interlocking um uh formerly sand grains let's call them mineral grains okay and so uh in a very very high grade quartzite it's like this it's totally interlocking if we're somewhere in the middle you might end up looking at this for a long time and asking yourself if you see pressure solution uh you know between those two uh grains uh and maybe you will and maybe you won't so so once again you know the trick with metamorphism is, is kind of always there's no line here here, right it's a continuum and so working out a low-grade quartzite can be a bit tricky uh, you know put it under some magnification look for pressure solution uh, look for flattening in these grains or something like that look around you where are you context always matters uh, and and work it out uh, another one that can be tricky for kind of the same reason um, is like a, a meta conglomerate Right. If I if I begin with a rock that's a conglomerate, and I think that's a brachiopod shell there. So anyway, what is that? Yeah, it's just yeah, it's a brachiopod shell. Uh, anyway, uh, you begin with a rock like a conglomerate, right, with rounded pebble-sized particles, or even a breccia with angular ones, right. And I apply heat and pressure to it; those pebbles flatten, right. Those pebbles flatten, and the nice thing is. Uh, you know, you, the, the direction of the pressure is kind of obvious, right? Uh, there's a Swiss Army knife for scale, but, you know, if the foliation or the flattening is running this way, the pressure is running this way. And I just said foliation when we're talking about a non-foliated rock. Oops, sorry. I just said foliation when we're talking about a non-foliated rock, and it's not technically foliation. So, so the pebble flattening is running this way, right? The pressure is running this way, and so you're good to go. Now, this can be a little bit tricky, though, in the real world. Um, imagine a stream, right? Streams make flattened pebbles, Right. I mean, uh, you know, if you ever want to skip a rock across the water, you're looking for one of those flattened pebbles. OK, streams make flattened pebbles. 
and those flattened pebbles are going to tend to align themselves perpendicular with, you know, the ground, right? And so you can get a conglomerate made of flattened pebbles that seem to be lined up, and it's not terribly unusual, so you do want to be a little bit careful. So how do you tell? How do you tell if this is a, you know, this is a pretty high grade medic conglomerate. It's pretty obvious what's going on here. But if it was a lower grade one, you're going to start to wonder. You're going to be going, ah, uh, is this a medic conglomerate? Or is this just a regular conglomerate with flattened pebbles that happen to be stacked up? Huh, what do you do? Well, Look around. Context is everything. Is there just a normal sandstone on top of it? It's probably a conglomerate, right? Um, but look for cracks. Cracks are your key. Um, if I look, if you look carefully at this meta conglomerate, see this crack running across the pebbles. That's the key to telling a meta conglomerate. Look for the cracks. If the cracks are running across the pebbles, that means that that pebble is really well indurated into that matrix, and it's a meta-conglomerate. Conglomerates, the cracks run either around the pebbles, or maybe the pebbles will even pop out of the... Um, of the uh, of the matrix, and so medical conglomerates don't really do that. And so, so the trick here is if you if you're really unsure. Now, now, honestly, though, if the pebbles are flattened, odds are it's a medic conglomerate. But you want to be you want to be sure. Uh, look for a crack. Okay, if the crack runs across the pebbles, bingo, it's a medic conglomerate. Um, if it runs around the cracks, it's not. It's 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 something else. It's well, it's it's a conglomerate. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. I tell you what. Um, I've been at this for 40 minutes. Let's take a break, um, and we'll come back. We'll finish this up with metamorphic environments and another couple of things. I'm going to put in five minutes of the Stone Mountain Grist Mill. Sit, relax, go to the bathroom, get some water, hydrate, stretch, breathe, all that good stuff. All right, here we go.
And, okay, we're back. I hope you took a break, because I did. Okay, so what are these in, where, what are these environments, right, where, where we expect metamorphism to happen? You know, where can we expect this heat and pressure um, to happen, okay? And so, first of all, uh, there's something, we, we alluded to this before, but let's talk about it now, and that's contact metamorphism, right? So this is going to be high temperature, low pressure metamorphism, right? What we're doing here is we are basically applying uh, heat to the rock, right? We're going to cook it. We're not going to apply any pressure. We're just going to apply heat, uh, but a lot of it. And we're going to do that with uh, with magma chambers or with dikes or with sills or something like that, right? And so this happens, uh, I say frequently, I should probably say always, um, when rock comes into contact with magma, right? The, the, and, then, and what you get is an area around that rock uh, where the rock has been altered, uh, and we call that a metamorphic halo or a metamorphic aureole. And so uh, you can see here's a magma chamber. And so that magma chamber is going to, um, you know, alter the rock right around it. Uh, and that's what we mean by contact metamorphism. This is a terrible picture. Uh, this is awful, okay? Uh, yes, that's igneous rock down there. Uh, that's going to be the surrounding what we sometimes call the country rock or the host rock around there. That much is true, but this entire thing is not a metamorphic aureole. It's just not. That's way too much. The metamorphic aureole is going to be right there along the contact. I'll show you a real one here in just one second. All of this, hun no, no, no. This magnitude magma chamber here did not thermally metamorphose that rock several hundred feet away. It just didn't, okay? Um, the other problem with this picture is they seem to imply that a metamorphic aureole, which this isn't, and a roof pendant are the same thing. They're not. A roof pendant is not a metam metamorphic aureole. A roof pendant is a xenolith. A roof pendant is a piece of the surrounding country rock that is broken off into that magma chamber and not melted. And so a lot of times with these magma chambers, especially when they start to cool, you'll get pieces of this country rock breaking off into that magma chamber. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about inclusions when we do... Um, when we do um, a geologic time, and so uh, th th this 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 whole thing is just a train wreck. Ignore this. Um, I don't know who labeled that thing, but it's just it's awful. Let me show you what an actual metamorphic uh, aureole looks like. Looks like this, right? It's just it's just, just that few feet, and this is actually a big one. Usually, the ones that I've seen in the field are inches. If they exist at all, um, contact metamorphism is in the field not something you want to rely on too much. Uh, when it happens, it happens, and that's great. But it doesn't frequently. It doesn't happen. If it does, it's very hard to see. Um, so, but but this is actually quite good. So here's an igneous body here. Um, and then uh, you can see the rock is darker here up against it. That's the contact metamorphism. In this case, it's really only a few feet, right? Which is why this whole thing, no, not, not, no. And this is, excuse me, this is big. This is huge. Um, usually it's really just a few inches so that when that when that um looks like a mafic uh something in there was was liquid it was hot it was really hot and it did a lot of alteration to the rock around it but you can also see that you know here it barely altered it at all i mean that white bit right in there is probably but so it, it contact metamorphism is tricky it really is and it's not something you want to rely overly on in the field it's funny i, I grabbed this picture over our break and when i put in you know metamorphic aureole metamorphic halo contact metamorphism what i got back was a lot of diagrams but very very few pictures in the field uh which i think kind of tells you that i'm not saying this is just theoretical but i'm saying that you know it's not terribly common in the field Okay, so uh, so 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 um, blowing up the pictures a little bit, uh, we can see that you know that hot magma chamber alters the rock around it. Uh, if that rock has water in it, that that's really going to help, right? Then you get kind of um, this uh, you know hydrothermal metamorphism actually. And so when that when that um, 
when that when that when that pluton cools you get altered rock around it once again this is probably drawn a lot thicker than it actually is and once again ignore this picture it's stupid okay i just i just i, I put it in because i'm pretty sure it's in the book and i want you to ignore it in the book okay okay um so um, so, you know, we can kind of talk about uh, metamorphic grade. Uh, oh, sorry. We are going to talk about hydrothermal metamorphism because it's kind of cool. But, um, but you know, uh, different rocks, uh, when exposed to this heat, will make different... Um, sorry, let me, let, me, let me back up. Different sedimentary rocks, when exposed to this heat, will make... Um, different metamorphic rocks, right? So the shale, if it's exposed to that, that magma chamber will make hornfels. That quartz sandstone, right, you'll get that pressure solution from the melt, the heat, and the little bit of pressure, you'll get quartzite, or that limestone will turn to marble, right? And so, uh, and then the grade of the metamorphic rock will get greater as you get closer and closer to the magma chamber um, if you have really well developed contact metamorphism. Uh, very well developed contact metamorphism. I'm not saying it's theoretical. I'm saying it's rare. Okay. Uh, now I mentioned water, and there is a whole other thing, right? Um, hydrothermal metamorphism. This is another um, low pressure kind of metamorphism, and uh, this is a uh, the picture that you see here is of a what we call a black smoker or a hydrothermal vent on the bottom of the ocean, and so you've got a magma chamber down there. These are very common along mid ocean ridges uh, where you have. Um, you know, a lot of volcanism and obviously a lot of water. And so that, you know, that water is heated by the magma chamber and water dissolves anything. Hot water dissolves anything really fast, right? And so, so that water dissolves minerals, precipitates minerals, moves minerals around, does all kinds of things. This, 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 uh, this process on land, and I'll show you in a minute here uh, how you can do that, produces um, what we call pegmatites, which are um, um, in the range of igneous uh, textures, pegmatite is even coarser grained than phaneritic, right? Really, really big mineral crystals that tend to be very, very rare elements like gold and things like that, right? But this is a form of metamorphism. I need to swallow water. Hold on. So this is a form of metamorphism that involves water. Right, so it's high temperature, low pressure metamorphism in the presence of abundant water. And one place this can happen is on the bottom of the ocean. By the way, um, this these are in what we would call the aphotic zone where there's no surface sunlight, and with no surface sunlight, uh, there's no photosynthesis. And so, but yet, look at all these uh, organisms living on this hydrothermal vent. Um, the uh, the basis for the food chain down here is chemosynthesis. Uh, you've got bacteria feeding on a lot of the stuff coming out of these hydrothermal vents, forming uh, the base of a food chain that can support a very diverse ecosystem uh, down here along these hydrothermal vents. Um, we spent a lot of time studying these because this sort of environment may have been the cradle for life on our planet originally. So it's a, a very interesting, uh, interesting environment and a really interesting overlap between the science of geology and biology, of which there are a lot of interesting overlaps. Um, if we want to do this on land, you know, if you have a magma chamber coming up. Um, and you have groundwater, oh boy, <laughs> right, there you go. Uh, you bring that magma chamber up into the shallower layers of the country rock that have water in them or groundwater in them, you can get all kinds of cool stuff going on, right? You can get, you know, these, these hydrothermal vein deposits that have, you know, all sorts of uh, interesting minerals and even some economic minerals and things like that. And so, and then you'll frequently, you'll get, uh, get geysers, right? If you have that, if you have that, that um that source of heat down there and you have groundwater water plus heat makes a geyser if it's close enough to the surface and so uh when we talk about um 
when we talk about volcanoes and we talk about Yellowstone, uh, we'll get more into geysers. Um, but still, it's uh, it's pretty uh, pretty fun stuff. Um, <coughs> the other thing you can do is something I alluded to before, and that's burial metamorphism, right? Where uh, where contact metamorphism is high, let me get it right, high temperature, low pressure, burial metamorphism is um, high pressure, low temperature, right? And so, you know, where, where you subduct the crust at a, at a convergent boundary, right? Once again, plate tectonics is everything, right? Where you subduct the crust, in a convergent boundary, right in through here. Not when you melt. When you melt, you're done. You're done. You're you're, you're igneous. <laughs> okay, but right in through here, uh, um, that's going to be uh, where you get that burial metamorphism. Right, it goes down relatively fast, relatively fast, um, and so suddenly the pressure goes up. The temperature doesn't go up that much. Remember, it melts down here, not because it's so hot, because it's so wet. <laughs> okay, uh, pressure goes up quickly though, so you'll get you'll get burial metamorphism in here. If that subduction shuts down, you can eventually erode or bring these rocks to the surface. Um, um, if it continues going down, though, it'll melt. And now you're back to igneous and maybe some contact metamorphism up in here if we want to keep on the metamorphism thing. Another environment where this can happen is if you have uh, a basin, a low area with a lot of sediment being washed into it, uh, that can bury rock quickly enough also to... Um, to, to metamorphose it just strictly from burial that's not nearly as common as subduction though uh it's really not it happens it's happened but uh but but most burial metamorphism is happening here at these subduction zones where that rock is being 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 um pushed downward relatively quickly uh the the pressure goes up the temperature goes up some but not that much and yeah you can see this this 300 um this 300 uh celsius uh contour you know goes down right? and so uh and so the temperature is not going up that much and then back here they have a picture you know, behind this this volcanic range, they have a photo. Uh, they've they've included a basin here, and this would be that environment where you know, I got mountains up here eroding pretty quickly, sediment washing into that basin, and so you can you know you could get that heated up to get enough to get some burial metamorphism there uh, pretty quickly. Like I said, this is not as common as this, but it does happen. What's really the most common kind of metamorphism and what people usually mean when they talk about metamorphism um, is regional metamorphism, right? This is where you smack one continent into another, you build a mountain range, and deep down you um you know you metamorphose the rock or even fairly near the surface right this is why all the rock up and down the east coast of the u.s in the appalachians is metamorphic right that was regional metamorphism underneath the veneer of sedimentary rock currently in the um the himalayas this process is happening ongoing right now um as india smacks into eurasia and so yeah so so yeah you smack these two things together and then you're going to get you know high grade metamorphism now the, the 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 interesting thing about this or the thing about this is in here in the middle yeah you're going to get high grade metamorphism it's going to be deep and you're going to get high grade metamorphism as you work your way outward from this mountain range the metamorphic grade goes down all right and so yes if you're in the appalachian mountains proper uh you're going to find high grade metamorphic rocks if you go east or west as you work your way east or west out of the appalachian mountains proper uh the metamorphic grade of the rock goes down okay it, it considerably um and so you know you can track that that collision by the foliation um of the rock and you can track kind of where you are quote unquote in the mountain range by the um by the degree of uh foliation or the degree of metamorphism right you're going to have higher grade metamorphism in here you're going to get lower grade metamorphism as you work your way out here and out here and then down in here you're going to get melting which is what made stone mountain um 
down in Georgia right now and down in here where you're melting you're not metamorphosing anything anymore right uh okay just um so so th this is the most common um if you by the way if you want to actually like know where this is literally happening as you drive north on i-75 um right at about Ma almost exactly at macon georgia you will cross into uh, the metamorphic rocks of the Appalachian Mountains. Now, notice you're nowhere near the actual Appalachian Mountains yet, right? I mean, I'm here in in um, Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, not in the Appalachians by any stretch, but the rock around me is metamorphic. It is it's part of that metamorphic complex that formed um, from the Appalachians. Those rocks begin um, right about Macon, Georgia, and I'm going to go grab a map real quick. I will be right back. Okay, let me show you. Sorry, these are usually things that I have in my classroom that I can point to that I don't, can't obviously do that with. But here's a, here's a really, I, I really like this actually. Here's a, a geologic map of the United States general. Uh, different colors represent different rocks, but then they've also thrown in the topography. And so you can see the topog topographically, the Appalachian Mountains begin kind of here in northern Georgia and then extend up into the, uh, up into New England and whatnot. But geologically, those metamorphic rocks extend all the way down to here, uh, to this curved bit here that we call, we call that the fall line. And like I said, if you're driving north on uh, 75 Macon is right about there, uh, right, right on that fall line and so all of this is the metamorphic rock that makes up uh, geologically the the metamorphic complex of the Appalachian Mountains and here I am right here in in Charlotte and sure enough those rocks extend over here uh, these are all coastal sediments uh, that kind of overlie this rock further south um, this this <laughs> the Appalachians used to extend all the way down and actually curved out here into eastern Texas uh, it used to be a much larger mountain range and if you were to drill underneath all this sedimentary rock here the coastal plain sediments you would find uh metamorphic rock from from this from this event so so um so so yeah so topographically the appalachians are, are you know right here and then up into new england but but geologically they extend much further than that you're into the the high grade metamorphic rocks of the uh, the appalachian orogeny which is actually several mountain building events not just one um uh, long before you get to the, the actual mountains. Like I said, I look around here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I find all kinds of metamorphic rocks. You know, I don't need to go over here to Asheville or Boone or something to see metamorphic rocks in the Appalachians. They're all around me. Um, and so, yeah, so it's kind of kind of interesting. So, uh, And like I said, drive north on 75, north of Macon. You are in metamorphic rocks uh, of the Appalachians. Um, okay, uh, a couple random things that are, that are uh, nevertheless kind of interesting. Um, there is something called dynamic or fault zone metamorphism, um, where, you know, you have a fault, you have rocks sliding along, um, past themselves, uh, and this creates a kind of a grinding and, a, a not even a melting, but pushing one, you know, pushing mineral grains into each other, pushing mineral grains against each other, uh, it does all kinds of things. Um, and so near the surface, you can get what's called a fault breccia, right? Where, where the grinding of that rock, um, the grinding of that rock will, um, uh, make a breccia. Uh, and so you, you, you know, turn into rock and it's a breccia. It's not an impact breccia or, or you know, an immature sediment breccia. It's a fault breccia. Uh, these are incredibly uncommon, <laughs> but, but they do exist. If you go a little bit deeper, if the fault's a little bit deeper, you might actually get some partial melting and that'll make a rock called a myelinite. Um, at the surface where rock grinds, a lot of times you'll get these grooves in the rock from the fault, and those are called slick insides. Uh, they are very uncommon, but they do exist. I have a funny slick inside story. The first time I was in the field, um, I, was, I was at Florida State. We were in the field doing something. I forget what it was, but there is this one... Um, person who none, <laughs> frankly none of us really liked um in the class and this person was just wandering all over the place finding all kinds of rocks that um they thought were slick inside so they were just like oh it's a, oh it's an oh, it's a, everything was a slick inside uh we were we were up in uh we were up in um 
uh, we were in the Appalachians. We had gone up up into some metamorphic rocks to see some metamorphic rocks. And we were all just like, surely these, I mean, none of us knew any better, but we were all like, surely these are not all slick in size. That can't possibly be that common. And, but none of us really wanted to say anything. And finally, the professor looked at them and said, will you please stop? That's just a shale you know, or a slate or something that you, you you will probably go your whole life and never see a slick inside unless you're a seismologist or that's what you study or something they are incredibly uncommon because these grooves will weather away pretty quickly uh and so uh not terribly common but it happens but don't make the mistake that that person did and think that everything they see in the field is a slick inside that, that they're not Sorry, might not have been that funny a story, but it, it was funny to me. Okay, um, another really kind of cool thing is shock metamorphism. This is high temperature, high pressure, but no time, right? So how do you do this? You smack something into the earth or into the moon or something like that, right? And so that's going to send a shock wave through that rock, Um uh, but, but, you know, it's, it, yeah, a temperature pulse and a shockwave pulse. So you get high temperature, high pressure, but it's over with in less than a second. And so what does that do? Well, that makes something called shocked quartz, where if you look at it, uh, under a microscope, the rainbow pattern is normal. It's what you get when you look at quartz under polarized light. I, I'm not going to go there. Don't if you if you go into geology, you'll learn all about that. Um, but uh, but the, the the shocking bit, <laughs> shocking is uh, are these lines running across the quartz. Uh, this this kind of reorientation of the um, of the crystal matrix in response to that shock. Uh, and so this is a really good sign that there was an impact nearby. You know, a lot of times the crater is gone. A lot of times the crater is has been filled in or, or ground away by a glacier. I mean, craters on the earth are not terribly common because of erosion. Right. And so uh, so but what will remain is this shocked quartz. And the more profound the shocking, <laughs> uh, the, the more shocking the rock is, the closer you are to the impact site. And so it's a very handy thing. We don't have a lot of craters, at least not ones exposed, not easy to see, but we do have shock quartz. Uh, and so it can be a very valuable thing if you are, if you are um, impact hunting. And so, yeah, so, so here, you know, if, if you have a fault, uh, you know, uh, once you know this is this is like a vertical fault. We'll learn later about normal and reverse faults. That one's vertical. Uh, you know, um, you know, kind of near the surface, uh, you'll get a, a, a fault breccia or you know brittle fracture or something like that. But deeper down, where you have more heat and more pressure, you get rocks um, um, deforming by you know slowly, and they ductile means it's like Play-Doh, so it will deform. Form. And so if you have a fault at the certain near the surface, you're going to get a fault breccia deeper, you're going to get a myelinite. And so you find those myelinites, you know, hey, 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 uh, this is a fault. You know, even if, if all the rock is the same, so you can't see any offset or anything, but you can identify a fault um, by the uh, by either the fault breccia near the surface or the myelinite uh, further down. And so, yeah, so we can in general... Um, talk about metamorphic grade um, and we can talk about you know the the temperature and pressure conditions that you get that will make certain you know, that are present in certain metamorphic environments and will therefore make certain metamorphic rocks right and so you know up in here at fairly low temperatures and fairly low pressures, you have what we talked about, hydrothermal metamorphism, right? Now, at higher temperatures where that water that is that would be here would be steam and not really be liquid and not really <laughs> contribute to the metamorphism. So at higher temperatures, you have contact metamorphism. Right now, uh, geologists love arranging our graphs like this. As you go down, the pressure goes up, right? And so that's kind of reverse, but to a geologist that makes perfect sense because you're you're graphing the conditions um, in the direction that they actually happen, right? And so you go down on the graph, and so here we have regional metamorphism, right, which is high temperature. High pressure metamorphism going from low grade on the edge of the mountain range to higher grade 
um, off, you know, um, in the center um, of the mountain range. And so most metamorphism is in here, right? Most metamorphism is in that purpley area there, right? But you do have subduction metamorphism, right? Which is once again, you know, um, high pressure, uh, relatively low temperature, right? And so that's going to be down here. They extend it kind of over here. Not too crazy about that because that's not really what that is. Uh, if, I, if I was drawing it, I would probably just cut it off kind of right there and put this up there, but that's okay. Um, uh, and so, right, so this is what happens at convergent boundaries where you have um, subduction, right? And so you have pressure rising precipitously, uh, temperature rising, but not rising that much. In here, this doesn't happen. Right? You cannot have this much pressure and that cool a temperature. Simply, physically not going to happen. Right, And so, so we have this kind of conceptual drawing, but here's how we can actually make this kind of concrete. Right, um, Different minerals... Uh, form at different heats and pressures, right? And so you can use the minerals that you see in the metamorphic rock to reconstruct in more detail the, the heat and pressure conditions that were happening, right? We already learned about how, you know, you can say, well, Slate is low grade, phyllite is higher grade, schist is higher, gneiss is higher. We already know that, right? And so, you know, and you can kind of see this up here, right? Where, you know, you start with a shale, that's a sedimentary rock, and then, you know, slate, phyllite, schist, gneiss, and then, you know, finally you're melting it, and now you're, ig now you're you know, magma, igneous, right? Uh, so we already know that. But what we can do is we can actually look at specific minerals in the rock and tell you know exactly how high or low grade the rock was oh excuse me let me drink some water here this is my last slide right so if you have you know chlorite muscovite and biotite you're in here right you are all three of those limit you to being you know up in here somewhere the rock would probably be a phyllite and low to intermediate grade, right? If, on the other hand, let's say you had chlorite and garnet. Well, those only overlap right there, right? And so now, <coughs> you know, you're in the low to intermediate grade, right? Um, you're a schist, but barely, okay? The garnets are probably going to be pretty small, right? And so, you know, so... You know, working your way up through here, right, you can use the assemblages of minerals to tell you, you know, what grade you're at. For example, if you have the mineral starlight, let's say you have starlight and muscovite, that's only going to happen right up in through here, intermediate to high grade schist, right? And so, so you can use, and this is a pretty simple diagram, right? Metamorphic petrologists have much more complicated diagrams okay uh but you get the idea right you know you know your minerals you look at them under a microscope maybe even uh, cut a very thin section pass some polarized light through it uh, use what we call a petrographic microscope that'll give you a much better idea identify your minerals figure out uh, what grade you are and that will tell you how close you are to that to the center of that that metamorphism right that tells you you know that that can tell you about you know physical geographic location uh with respect to the event that caused that metamorphism so it is it is pretty uh pr pretty helpful stuff it really is and so so like i said this finishes up rocks and you know um once again, it's not just a question of, oh, look, a cool rock, uh, you know, which is fun. I mean, I admit, uh, but, but, you know, but it's okay. What can that rock tell us? Uh, that, that's what we really want to know. Uh, for igneous rocks, you know, we can tell where it cooled. We can tell the chemistry of where it came from. For sedimentary rocks, we can get um, environment of deposition. What environment did this rock form in? Is it a desert? Is it a lake? Is it a, a beach? Is it a tidal channel? Is it a braided river? Whatever. Um, uh, and then, um, you know, for metamorphics, we can talk about, we, we start talking about tectonics then, right? We start talking about the direction of the pressure. We start talking about how much pressure there was. And, you know, we, we use a lot, we use metamorphic rocks a lot to reconstruct tectonic settings and whatnot and so yeah so there's metamorphic rocks and once again this is the last lecture in module one
So I'm going to go ahead and get that up, and I will talk with you guys later. We'll be, well, next time you see me, we'll be working, or see me. You can't see me because I turned the camera off. Actually, my camera's not working. Anyway, um, next time you hear me, uh, we'll be working on material for Module 2. Okay, y'all take care. Bye-bye.